What we're going to do is give every panelist an opportunity to say one word in closing, something to, excuse me, I said one word, it's been a long day. <laughs> one minute or a very short comment to empower our audience on our topic, which is leadership. I, I win. <laughs> In truth, I haven't been to the U.S. in over a decade. Um, I don't really travel to the U.S. Um, however, I do think that there's something I'd like to impart on our remedies and overseas guests. Um, we, when we were talking about race earlier, and I understand the fraternity and I understand the majority of the audience, but I think that I couldn't leave you without understanding a few realities about Bermuda and race and commerce in the 21st century. Um, there are two major retailers, big three, big retailers in Bermuda. Uh, one called Kukus, one called Gibbons, and one called Brown. Brown is a black man. There are two overseas long distance carriers in Bermuda Cable and Wireless, which was recently sold to Canadian, and TBI. The CEO of TBI is a black man. Digicel, I understand, their CEO is a black man. <laughs> the two large accounting firms you may have heard of, KPMG and Price Waterhouse, both of them have black power. Appleby, which is Bermuda's perhaps leading, I think CMP may add a bit, um, the managing partner for the Bermuda office is also a black man. Um, Ace, direct competitors in terms of size with Excel, its president is a black Bermudian man. I say all this to say that it's not the U.S. in Bermuda in terms of race. I know a lot of Bermudians. I sat with one at Obama's inauguration and he had tears in his eyes. And I just don't understand it. I, we had E.T. Richards, we had John Swan, we had Alex Scott, and, and to me, we're not American, and I didn't quite feel that. But if I just leave you this list, I'm going to give you a list of five books that if you do want to understand a bit about Bermuda and its history and slavery and where we've come from, um, the first is The Many-Headed Hydra. That book was given an ILO prize because it dealt with labor and slavery and throughout the sort of English. We're going to actually to yep, I'm wrapping it up. And in fact, chapter one, they say this, this event, chapter one, was the start of global capitalism. That event, that event was the wreck of the sea venture in Bermuda. That's what they say started world capitalism. The other book is Partnership with Peace and Prosperity. Uh, one of our rights is a book written by the Premier of the Times on our rights. The next one is In the Eye of All Trade. This one, I just want to say this real quick. Uh, this one of the stories that came out of this book. Uh, well, we'll chapter one. In Korean, I'm But this U.S. captain with a ship uh, pulled up next to a Bermuda ship. Back in the day, he was fired. And so this guy was going to arrest this ship. When he got there, put him next to a small Bermudian ship. He looked down, and this is in the old Congress, the rapid is in the Congress. And he looked at the ship and saw that there were 74 men on board. Four were white. Doors slave. And the guy remarked, there is no way that could be an American ship with <laughs> those guys still even going to be alive out of the sea. There's 70 black men on board. So we have a little bit of a story there as well. And this got the BIU. That's another one. Thank you. I'd like to say, gentlemen, to the brothers of Alpha, thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. I think specifically what this is highlighted to me for the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the need for this organization to span its global horizons. We have an organization that is really, really dynamic. All of the tenants that we spoke about, we have in abundance. It is now time for us to take our organization, and I'm so glad we have come to you. But this conversation, the being on this panel, as team man, I would like to see our organization branch to the four corners of this world, taking our unique brand of leadership that we know transforms lives, taking it into um, the University of the West Indies, going into Accra, going all over the, the, the African diaspora in a real way, but this time in, in, our, in our world's history. We have an opportunity now to do more outside of the United States of America, and I challenge the brothers present to hold our organization accountable to take this message around the world. The second part, the second part is I would encourage, and I call them Josh, Joshua generation, young people in this audience that, that find themselves back in the university, in between going to university. We 
need for you to step up and find your rightful place in our country. You need to stop being on the sidelines, sending tweets and being on Facebook, and grab a part of the problems in our country and make a solid contribution. I think the last, my last point is mentorship. I, this is the, the drum that I will continuously, continuously beat. We need for every man and woman that has the opportunity to pass a legacy on to someone else, not only their, their children or in their family, to an extended family. We need to pass our oral traditions, our skills, our, uh, the homilies, our singing, our music. We need to transition this on to a new generation of each person in this room mentoring another young person. Thank you. I'd like to also congratulate Absalom for allowing us as Paragon and all the in our community and Amplify Alpha uh, to continue to uh, show the light and shine the light. I will quote the great Joseph Lowry in conclusion when he said at the funeral of Corella Scott King, Will words become deeds that meet people's needs? And he said that uh, because you had presidents and former presidents and governors who paid tremendous tribute to that great uh, woman, Coretta Scott King, and the family. And he said, we've heard wonderful things, but will this translate into deeds? And I think that that's important, because we have numerous symposiums like this. We have numerous discussions like this. I sit in the House of Assembly, and every Friday, I hear tremendous speeches. And you heard it tonight. That's why I tell you I'm blessed to be able to serve with the likes of the Honorable Alex Scott. But we have to translate this passion. We have to translate this intellectual capacity and actually go out there and meet our community at its need. And when we do that, then I think collectively we will rise and we will become the society and the people that we can be. It is a wonderful Experience, not to be six feet under, but heavy folks refer to you as if you have passed the way. <laughs> I think as a senior member of the current government on the panel, I wish to welcome, thank you for coming, the Alpha members, and ensure you that you are in a very exceptional place. We are 600 miles off of the Carolinas. Geographically, we're supposed to be the most, one of the most isolated points of geography anywhere in the world. And I haven't sorted it out yet. Whether the Lord has put us out here to protect us from you, or whether he's put us out here to protect you from us. Whatever the answer, Enjoy yourself. We certainly enjoy having you here. And there's one thing left. We must come back again and again and again. Very hard to compete with these wonderful speakers up there. And uh, we, 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 we all uh, have a, a passion. You know, I think that's the word I'm going to leave with you tonight is when you believe in something, you must become very passionate about it and, uh, and pursue it. Because uh, we only have so much time. And in fact, when you get down to it, most people only have a moment which they really, it's a timing and the moment they have to do something. And I think for us in Bermuda, and I think for the United States, uh, and this Western, our Western civilization, the moment has come that we must find what is it that we can apply our passion to and with. And there's no greater passion and commitment that we can make than to our fellow human beings. And if I had to sort of say what I'd like to do is to have the passion and the commitment to try to encourage the collaborative effort, whether you're black, white, rich, poor, whether you're foreign or local, uh, that we come together because we know the fact that when in a little island like this, when one fails, we all will fail. And therefore, we should try and make sure that we all pull each other up because we are truly our brother's keepers. When I was a
Commissioner, please, uh, Dwayne Keynes to my right was actually my press officer. And I learned a very quick lesson, and I had to learn it once. When he says 60 seconds, that's all you've got. <laughs> First of all, I would really like to extend my thanks for the invitation. I feel honored to be here tonight, and I will treasure this particular opportunity to have engaged in this uh, panel discussion. My message is really directed towards the younger members that are here tonight. I'm sorry if I have a sort of bias towards that, but most of us have all found our way through looking at the examples of others. So the only thing I would like to say to the younger members that are here tonight, that as you seek to find your way in a very complex and difficult environment, be very careful who you seek out you know, for the leadership traits that you admire and the ones that you want to emulate. And don't be afraid that there will be occasions that you will have to stand alone on your particular convictions. Thank you all for coming. First of all, thank the organizers for inviting me to the session. It has been a stimulating and for me very important session because leadership is such an issue that's crying out for, for change. It needs to be looked at in, in so many ways. We look around us and we see that there is a challenge of strong, effective, and visionary leadership in the world. And we have so many issues and challenges to sort out that we need them. The appeal, the global appeal of Barack Obama when he was campaigning for the presidency is that he reflected principled leadership and had a very strong vision. Perhaps the most important aspect of what he represented and why I cite him as a, a great leader is that he gave people a sense of hope. And we need hope to give us a desire to continue to make the change, to try to make the change that's needed. And if we can have a greater level of hope here in the United States and elsewhere, then we, the people, can put a greater demand on those who seek to lead us. Because when the people are involved, and when the people are active, are active we can, try, we can help to ensure that the necessary leadership is in place and the change that we desire, the change that we need, is actually created. Thank you very much. Mandy Deeds, scholarship, and law for all mankind. Deeds, what needs, what are your opportunities? My mother always said that I was an idealist, and I still am an idealist. I try to be realistic. I try to be more realistic as I get older, but the truth is I'm an idealist. And what I would say to everyone here is you all have an expectation for the world you want to live in. So why don't you think about the world that you do live in, think about the world that you want to live in, and create the world that you want to live in in your daily environment. 